Hey, how's it going, everyone? This is episode 225 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And today, we have something a little different. Those of you that have been around a little while remember episode 100, where I was on the other side of the microphone. I was interviewed by past guest, Mr. Dan Hart. But here, again, I'm on the other side. Well, this time it's Sensei Ando, a past guest of this show, bringing me on to his show. Fight for a Happy Life, episode 51, where... Honestly, since Ando went kind of deep, he did a whole bunch of research, dug into my personal life, and we got into some good stuff. Now, it's no secret that I have a tremendous amount of respect for Sensei Ando, for the quality of his show, and frankly, the fact that it's from listening to him, watching what he does, that has helped push martial arts radio along. Because I'm trying to constantly elevate the caliber of the show, not just in the guests and the content, but in the audio quality, in my skills as an interviewer. And frankly, I have found Sensei Ando to be top-notch. So for him to invite me onto his show was nothing short of an honor. I had a great time doing it. And it's a little bit different style. It's not the structured interview in the way that you're used to here. For those of you that write in, and admittedly, and maybe it's just because I'm a humble guy, a lot of you want to know more about me. That's weird to me, but okay. <laughs> Here's your opportunity. We get into a lot of stuff that, frankly, has never been discussed on other episodes of Martial Arts Radio. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Sensei Ando, for having me on your show. So let's do it. Today on Fight for a Happy Life, an interview with Mr. Jeremy Lesniak. This is Fight for a Happy Life. Sensei Ando. Welcome to episode number 51 of Fight for a Happy Life, the show that believes even a little martial arts makes life a whole lot better. I'm your host, of course, Ando, and today, something different. Way back in episode number one, I promised you interviews, but I realized as we approached 50 episodes, I've only delivered two. What can I say? I like to talk. But that doesn't mean I'm not interested in learning how other people are fighting for a happy life. So today, a chat with Mr. Jeremy Lesniak. If you don't know Jeremy, he's the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. According to the website, Whistlekick manufactures the world's best sparring gear. Jeremy's also the host of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, a weekly podcast devoted to the promotion of traditional martial arts. That's actually how we met. He was kind enough to invite me onto his show, and believe it or not, we ended up talking more off record than on record. (laughs) He really seemed like an interesting guy, so it only made sense to invite him over here to be on our show. Of course, it's possible that I'm completely wrong and he's got nothing to say, but that's what makes interviews so much fun. Let's find out. Either way, if you haven't subscribed to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, go do that. It features over 200 episodes mostly interviews, which makes it a great resource if you're interested in connecting with other folks making their way in the martial arts. And if the quality of Jeremy's podcast is any indication of the quality of the sparring gear he makes, well, then I'd say that gear is probably worth checking out too. Of course, I'll put the links to Jeremy's website and podcast in the show notes over on fightforahappylife.com. But right now, let's meet the man himself. Mr. Jeremy Lesniak, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. This is going to be fun. I really hope so. <laughs> a lot of that's me up too. to you. So I hope you're in a good mood. I hope you're in a really good mood. I'm um, generally in a good mood. You know, to be honest, and, and you know, I'm sure the listeners might think that I'm, I'm kissing butt a little bit, but I'm generally in a good mood when I listen to you. Wow. You're a pretty, pretty happy guy. Wow. That's a beautiful thing to say. Are you flirting with me? This is getting awkward right off the bat. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Maybe it's like, <laughs> it's like a date. We're on like a first date right now. Oh boy. All right. Well, this just took a strange turn. Um, 
I'm just really happy to have you on the show. It was an honor to be on your podcast. You do a high quality show over there um, on the Whistle Kick uh, Martial Arts Radio, and um, I'm really hoping that some of my listeners will take a look at what you're doing over there because you're certainly a, uh, promoting a good image for traditional martial artists everywhere. And um, it's just nice to be part of that community in some small way. So I appreciate you making some time to be here with us. Well, thank you. You know, I, I appreciate. Everything that you're doing, you're doing some great stuff, and it was an honor to have you on our show. And I know the listeners absolutely loved it. We got a lot of great feedback, and you know, for us to to come together again. I mean, it's, it's absolutely kind of like, it's like fusing. I don't know, like BJJ and and Shotokan or something. I don't know. It's there like, you go. You don't you don't know what you're going to get out of it, but it's probably going to be pretty good. I, all right, now I like that. I know that you uh, right before we went on uh, record here. You still see this as a competition of some kind between podcasts. You're, and, uh, you're kind of pulling my words a little differently <laughs> here. I, I think, you know, you're, you're setting me up. I don't know. Um, Not at all. What, what I mean, and listeners, you will probably get this. Maybe, maybe I did a poor job of explaining it the first time, but there are, there are a handful of us in the traditional martial arts world that have podcasts. Mm-hmm. And we're all, at least I think most of us, aware that we're not the only ones. Mm-hmm. And so I listen to your show and, and Marshall Thoughts with, with Jared Wilson and a sure. handful of others sure. because, one, I'm part of the target demographic. I started my show because I wanted the show that I started. Right. And now I get to talk to cool people like you, and so like it's changed my life, and it's a lot of fun. But by the same token, we're doing similar things. So mm-hmm. I want to watch what you're doing because you've helped me get better at certain things. Awesome. It's like train. It's like training in the dojo. You know, you look at what the guy next to you is doing, and you say, "Ah, right. I like what he's doing there. I'm going to tweak what I'm doing in that way." You know, we're we're bringing each other up. Rising tide that. lifts all. Sh- I love that. All right. Well, in that spirit, then I guess we can continue. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad. I- my computer is about to get a virus. You were going <laughs> to yep. digitally kick me in the face. That's right. I was going to immediately stop recording. I was going to slam your show and uh, put some lies on the internet, <laughs> crush your show. No, you yeah, be the so. first. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, boy. Oh, sorry to hear that. Um, oh, no. You know what? Until you're getting hate mail. Yeah. You're not pushing it hard enough. That's that's true. In fact, you just inspired me to do some more offensive things and push my agenda farther to really get some hate mail, death threats. Until I'm shot, I'm not going to be satisfied. So thank you for All right. that. Well, I'll, uh, I mean, I know you've got some much stricter gun laws out in California than we do here in Vermont, <laughs> but I'll see what I can do. I'm not sure they make a difference, <laughs> but yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> let's go this direction. Now, this show is called Fight for a Happy Life, as you know. Um, so I'm curious, what do you consider a happy life? What is your vision? Uh, What are you fighting for? That's awesome. I I love that you spin it in that way. So to me, a happy life is one where you wake up in the morning and you're looking forward to the day. Mm. And when you're going to bed, you're satisfied, you're smiling about what happened during the day. And obviously it's not going to happen every day, but hopefully the majority of them, five, six days a week, and is that where you are now? Do you feel like you're going to bed uh, every night with a smile on your face most of the time? So how, how's it going for you? How's your fight going? The fight's going well. It's still, you know, it's it's a little bit of an uphill battle. Anyone that's ever started a business knows that it's hard work. Being an entrepreneur mm-hmm. is challenging. Uh, the best kind of anecdote I ever got was from a friend who had started a number of businesses. He's a little bit older. And he said, working for yourself is is great. You know, you, you get a lot of control and you can even pick when you work, you only have to work half a day and you even get to pick which 12 hours it is. <laughs> and that's always really resonated for me. You know, this is this is not my first business that I've started. But when I go to bed, I, I won't lie. I'm not always happy, but I'm always satisfied. Mm-hmm. I know what it feels like to put in a, a good hard day's work. And, and that's, you know, that really speaks well to me. I, you know, I've always been a hard worker. My My mother's been self-employed her whole life. So I oh. kind of come from that legacy. But generally when I wake up in the morning, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm usually at my desk by 7 a.m. at the latest and just cranking it out. Awesome. I love that hustle. Well, that's interesting. So your mother has been self-employed. I was wondering, because I, I saw on your website, it said that uh, the company has taken a lot of time, money, and sweat 
uh, to get going. And that was back in I believe, 2010. So that's about seven years ago, six and a half years ago. Um, I was, was there a pivotal moment when you decided like you didn't want to work for anyone else? Were you always self-employed just like uh, your mother was a role model for? Or what was the big turning point to say, okay, that's it. I'm definitely going double down on me. I want to be independent. Um, how did that come about? Well, in hindsight, it was kind of this, this happy accident. Uh, I came out of college and moved up to Vermont with uh, my, my college girlfriend. She was coming up here to attend law school. And I had a job offer at Dartmouth College to do some IT stuff. And they pretty much assured me, you have a job. And then kind of last minute, the job fell through. And when I was in college, I'd been working at the local Staples store and doing some kind of computer consulting on the side and realized I can't build the life, the happy life that I want working at Staples. So what would it look like if I really pursued this consulting thing? Mm -hmm. And from that decision there, I was full time at Staples for six months and I was only at that store for 18 months total. And then I was full time on my own. And that was 2003, sorry, 2002. And I haven't looked back. Wow. You know, I've, I've, I've had some side gigs, you know, I coached gymnastics for a few years, you know, 90 minutes a week, you know, I've done some other small stuff, but pretty much right out of college, the majority of my income has come from my own pursuits. Wow. That's, that's a, probably a dream for most people, right? To be able to call your own shots and make your own money. That's uh, wow. That's pretty impressive. Um, and now with Whistlekick, uh, you get the opportunity to talk with lots of martial artists, go to tournaments. Um, you're, you're a bigger and bigger part of the martial arts community. Um, how's that going? What kind of vibe do you get out there? I mean, you're coming in as uh, a manufacturer of goods, but you're also there, you know, sponsoring athletes and uh, sponsoring events as well. Um, what's your vibe on the current traditional martial arts scene? It's, it's poised to grow, right? I, I think pretty much anybody that's spent a lot of time in martial arts, especially if you've been a school owner, you've seen these cycles come in and, and go out, you know, a movie will come out and all of a sudden people will be interested and then, you know, that'll fade. And I feel like we're coming up out of one of those lulls right now. I'm starting to see events bringing in more attendance, people talking about, hey, I haven't had this many people at my tournament in 10 years, 20 years, or even record setting events. And I think that we're in a place as the world is becoming so informal, so casual, that for a lot of people, they're looking for some structure, some formality to lean on, you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that rigidity that a lot of us kind of, you know, I'm, I'm 38. I remember it when I was a kid, maybe not so much folks younger than me, but anyone that grew up with that and doesn't see it in the world, I think on some level we miss it. So people are coming into the traditional martial arts saying, you know, this is giving me something to balance out the rest of my life. Mm. And I think if we all can push that and, and recognize that, you know, if we if we work together on this, if we can promote the traditional martial arts versus the, the 9,000 other things that we all kind of compete against, right? I, I've heard so many school owners say, you know, their competition is not the martial arts school down the street, it's soccer. Mm -hmm. Or it's, it's baseball season, right? We can get more people in. And one of my, my firm beliefs, and you may have heard this on the show, and we may have some crossover listeners, and I say this all the time, martial arts is the only thing where six months of experience has lifetime effects. Mm. Show me any other sport you can put somebody in and give them six months. Six months of tennis, that doesn't change somebody's life. But six months of karate or kung fu does at any age. That's a great message. Um, although if you play football for six months and you get a head trauma, uh, <laughs> that might change your life in a negative way. How about that? Right, right. And that is, <laughs> that is a sad life. Yeah, that's a sad life. That is a sad life. And I'm, I'm not fighting for a sad life. And I know you're not. <laughs> that, that's a good, I would change sports if I was fighting for a sad life. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a really uh, a great point. Um, the traditional martial arts, like you say, is a nice counterbalance to the um, how dress codes have fallen away and uh, people following um, strict codes and guidelines it seems to be falling away. Um, and to find that balance, I think, is the secret to a happy life. You can't, 
you don't necessarily want to have a militaristic life or everything is regimented, but you also can't just be a free floating um, hippie who has no goals, steps to those goals um, and ways to achieve things. So finding that balance that there are days when you have to get things done and you know how to do that. And then there are days when you can float a little and uh, absorb some life. I think that's important. Balance. Uh, I'm all about that as well. So, uh, yeah, well said. And that's encouraging if you find that these events are growing and you're getting more support. Um, boy, I'd like to believe that. So, oh, I hope Absolutely. that's true. Great. Yeah, it's yeah, and it's a lot of fun getting out there. And you know, I, I get to train and write it off as a business expense. I mean, that's fantastic. You know, I've been to weekend long camps the last two weeks, and nice. You know, I got to deduct my mileage and my entry fees and all that, and just hang out and and be a professional martial arts something. I don't, I don't know what I am, what my, <laughs> my title outside whistle kick is. You know, I'm, I'm a guy who does stuff with martial arts. Right. You're living the dream. Sounds awesome. Um, it's a happy life. Happy life. Well, good. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Don't worry. There'll be more challenges to come. Don't worry. You're not done oh, yet. I, oh, I'm Did fully aware. 38. Is that what you said? <laughs> I am. I am. <laughs> Get ready. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you've also uh, through your podcast um i think you have over 200 episodes now right you're way up there yeah uh we're recording this in episode 211 yeah. drop today congratulations on sticking Thank with you. it um now that you not only have your experiences of growing up in a variety of martial arts schools and um be seeing people through a business interface but now also um through the podcast what do you notice about martial arts? Do you think there, do, you, do you think there are any commonalities here? Are there just certain traits you just keep running into over and over again that just keep hitting you over the head? Like, you know what? This is how you know that guy's a martial artist because this. Um, or do you think it's just pretty much a widely, you know, wildly rather diverse group? What patterns have you found? I think that martial artists overall are, are a pretty good cross-section of society. But I think within martial artists, we see some self-awareness with some things that the general population may not see. For example, perseverance. Mm. The idea that I'm going to bang my head against this wall until it falls down, or I'm going to find a way to go around it, you know, whatever visual metaphor you want to use. Martial artists are much more aware of that than I think the general population is. Hmm. I think everyone has the ability to grow and achieve whatever they want. One of my favorite anecdotes is that people are like goldfish. They will grow to the size of the bowl you put them in. Whatever the expectation is, whatever they have to do, you know, how many how many stories are there of, you know, the, the cliche of the mom lifting the car to get the baby? I mean, there's so much of that stuff that happens every day because it had to happen. Right. Because people were called to do that. And as martial artists, we have a lot of those stories. Right. And I think it's because of the way that we train and the way that we instruct the younger generations to beat them over the head to say, you can do this and that and the next thing and whatever's beyond that that you really want to accomplish. Nice. Yeah, I'm trying to reflect on that as you're speaking about that. Like, does that apply to me and the people I know? I, I think that rings pretty true. Um, just being problem solvers in general um, uh, at least the good martial artists. Maybe that's the, the easier pattern to see. The good martial artists are the people who persevere and solve the problems. I mean, if you're in a choke or someone's hitting you with a barrage of punches and kicks, ultimately that's just a puzzle. Um, that to me, that's like a nice impersonal way to look at it. It's just this is just a puzzle. Now, how do I solve this puzzle? Where do I have to put my hands? How do I breathe? What am I looking at? What decisions do I need to go through here? Um, and so when you apply that to the rest of your life, whether it's trying to work out your finances or work out a relationship or start a business, again, it's just a series of puzzles that you've got to figure out. And, um, as long as you persevere, you can usually find a way to get it done. Uh, so I think that's a pretty astute uh, observation there. Good one. Thank you. Um, and then of course, you know, there, there are, there are other things. They're not all positive. You know, there's, uh, one of the ones that people find most interesting and, uh, and I'll share this. I've, I've shared it a, a couple of times. There seems to be an inverse correlation between accomplishments and focus on title. <laughs> wow. Now we're going to get into some offensive territory. Hey, I like this. Hey, doing it on your show, not mine. I love this. So, for instance, if someone calls himself Sensei Ando, you feel <laughs> right off the bat, I've marked myself as someone who probably won't accomplish things because I have so much ego invested in my title. Uh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> because I think, you know, it's, it's when... 
you know, when we break that title down, you know, what does sensei mean? It, it, it's generally accepted as teacher in Japanese. Right. It's the senior grandmaster, great grandmaster. And it's not so much the possession of the title. It's the insistence on the use of the title. Right. For example, when, um, you know, be, because I'm a, a somewhat public person, I get people friending me all the time on Facebook, people I don't know. And, you know, I don't generally accept them unless we have a bunch of mutual friends and then, mm-hmm. you know, hopefully I'll beat them one day. But some of those people are throwing their title in as their first name. <laughs> you know, I, I'm someday would it be cool for someone to refer to me as great grandmaster such and such? Sure. But it's never going to replace Jeremy in my Facebook name. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to introduce myself as anything other than Jeremy. Even in a, a martial arts setting, I will introduce myself as Jeremy Lesniak. And then if formality is part of the environment, I will say, you know, it would be appropriate for you to refer to me as sensei. That's the only title I've ever wanted because I enjoy being a teacher. Mm-hmm. I don't take that title because... Um, it's something I've, I've aspired to in a, uh, an ego way, you know, as, as people progress up ranks, there, there are additional titles. And, and I think that is great, but I think some people hide behind those titles to define who they are. Right on. Yeah. No, I think you're right on the money there. Titles make up for maybe sometimes a lack of accomplishment or like the tradition, maybe in Japan, the way it's been explained to me. People will call you a sensei, but you should never call yourself a sensei. Um, mm. So I think that's and a I don't, nice way. I don't want the listeners to think that I'm against titles. Because when I bring guests onto the show, you know this, you've been on our show. I introduce everyone in some kind of respectful title. I've never introduced anyone by simply their first name. At the very least, it's Mr. or Miss or Mrs. if they don't have or don't want some manner of title. Mm-hmm. But the biggest names, and I'm not gonna, I'm not going to name drop because – there's a bit of ego in that too, right? right? But if someone looks through the episodes we've had, we've had some pretty big names, names that honestly, like in the moment of interviewing, I was shocked that I got to talk to this person. <laughs> and almost without fail, when I said, how would you like me to introduce you? They said, just call me by whatever their first name was. Mm-hmm. And there are a few exceptions. But when I look through the people that were really desiring for titles, for their titles. They hadn't done nearly as much as the other folks who just wanted to be by the, their first name. Yeah, that's that's probably because they're still working, they're still humble, they still know that they don't know everything, and uh, that's a real student right there, right? We're always learning. Um, all right, so you uh, a couple fun things about Mr. Jeremy Lesniak. Let's uh, see if any of these things are true. If I to believe, if I'm to believe your Instagram feed. Uh, it might be interesting to some people if they don't know you. Um, is this true? True or false, sir? Do you have a license plate with the word kata on it? I do. Uh, the license plate for my motorcycle is kata. Uh, the license plate for my summer car is kata meister. Oh boy. Uh, let's, let's talk about ego there, right? Um, (laughs) so (laughs) for those who don't speak German, what does that mean? I don't, I don't. (laughs) Uh, if you Google Kadameister, you get some stuff about me and you get some random karate schools in Germany. Uh-huh. Um, but it used to be just me. And, and I do own the domain Kadameister.com. Is that right? So I do. I do. Way, way back uh, when, I was, when I was a teenager and I was competing, kata was my thing. For those that might not be Japanese practitioners, that's forms, tol, hyung, pumse, patterns, whatever you call it. I just I loved them. You know, I, I was a social outcast and I, I <laughs> didn't relate as well to other people. But forms, it was just me. I only had to be better than myself the day before. And I loved that. So I did well in competition with that. And after one probably victory, one of my instructors was really excited and said, hey, you're the Kadameister. <laughs> and then a couple years later, when my mother signed us up for dial up Internet, we had to pick a username. <laughs> And she picked Kadameister. And it kind of became this online persona. And it became, as a a nerdy kid living in the woods of Maine, it was my ability to reinvent myself as someone who was confident and powerful and articulate because all that mattered were my words. Mm -hmm. I've always been good with words and I'm a fast typist. Uh. So I would go into chat rooms and I could completely dominate. Somebody would pick (laughs) on someone and I could just eviscerate them 
in text. Wow. And I took a lot of strength from that name. And then when I got my first car in Maine, it was like a $15 a year fee for a vanity plate. So I put Kottemeister on it. And everyone knew, hey, that was my car. And that became fun. So I've just kind of continued that. <laughs> I love that story. Yeah, that is. Do you want it to, to still be referred to as the Kottemeister? Is that offensive to you now? That's too old hat? or is... It's not offensive, but uh, Kata is still something that I'm, I'm known for. Uh, I've done Kata three times in competition in the last 10 years. Um, twice last year, or I guess 11 years now. Twice last year and then once in 2006. Beautiful. Um, just to, um, this past year, I was getting a lot of people coming up to me at events saying, I just found out that you train martial arts. They thought I was just showing up at events selling stuff. Oh. They thought I was some opportunistic business person. Gotcha. So I said, all right. So I put on my gi and I competed a couple times just to show them, hey, I can hang with these guys. Mm. So you're an opportunistic business person and a quality martial artist. You can do both. Exactly. Well, I, I'll, I'll let others be the judge of the quality, but I am also a martial artist. Excellent. Another fun fact I think I see on your Instagram feed, you have an earring. Is that right? Uh, I have three. I used to have five. You used to have uh, five. You were 38, and you now still have three earrings. Yeah. So uh, What's uh, up with that? Each of my earlobes is pierced. And so one of my other passions, um, and as a kid from the woods of Maine, this often doesn't resonate. It doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but you know, I, I grew up, um, with some challenging childhood stuff, single mom, not a lot of friends. And I found my solace in rap music. Oh, wow. So in the early nineties, um, if anyone out there is a, a rap music fan, when Dr. Dre dropped his, his first album, um, you know, his, his seminal work, he had earrings. And in 1992, I didn't know any other men that had two earrings. I mean, barely any men had one. And I said, someday I will pierce both of my ears. And five years later, as soon as I was out of, out of Maine and I was in college, I had my roommate bring me to the mall and I went to Claire's and the girl needled both of my ears. And then over the next couple of years, I put one in the top of, of each ear. Those have since come out. Then in 2007, I pierced my nose. Oh, boy. Because Tupac had pierced his nose. Wow. And he was one of the strongest influences on my childhood. And, and anyone that knows him, his, his movies or music casually might think that's a, a really strange role model. But anyone that, that has read his poetry that knows, you know, maybe the lesser known music knows how, how deep and philosophical and political he was. And that was kind of my, well, one of my homages because I also have, uh, I have a few tattoos and uh, his f first tattoo was one of mine. Wow. I did not see and this coming. No, no, few people do. <laughs> um, you know, the, the tattoos, the piercings, they tell the story of my life. I, there are no color to any of my tattoos. There, there's a whistle kick logo tattoo because the logo is trademarked now. That will go on my body sometime soon because I just want, to be able to reflect and look at my body and say, this is who I am. You know, scars tell a story, tattoos, earrings, they tell a story. And my body tells a story of who I am and where I've been. Fair enough. Wow. I did not see that coming. The uh, young boy growing up in Maine in the woods and hip hop and rap being your big influences. Yeah, um, and those are more of your role models maybe than even Bruce Lee. I know you started martial arts very young, like at four um, so, but really you started identifying yourself when you got to be of age, um, with the rap scene is more than the, uh, like the, the Asian, you know, stereotypes, martial arts scene. Is that fair? Or did you have both as role models or? No, no, that's fair because we didn't have cable growing up. So I didn't get to see much in the way of martial arts. Hmm. Um, you know, my, my mother took me to see the Karate Kid and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but that was really about it. So my role models were what I saw on TV. I was a little bit, you know, by the time uh, Power Rangers came out, I was a little bit too old for it. So I had Ninja Turtles. But the place where I was able to escape was rap music because the, the thrust of most of that music is about challenge and difficulty and overcoming obstacles and finding your place in the world. 
And and I guess you could argue that's that's the thrust of a lot of music, at least some. But that was just what spoke to me. It was generally high energy. It was passionate. And I felt like I wasn't alone. Hmm. So important, right? Yeah. Human need there. Yeah, even from, uh, isn't that the beauty of it, right? That's why the internet is so great. There are so many people who don't have to feel alone because no matter how uh, niche your interests are or how unusual you think you are, maybe in your hometown you're the one of a kind, but when you look out on the internet, you find that there's maybe that one person in lots of small towns and now you have a community. Uh, it seems like a miracle nowadays that there's just more and more opportunity to build bridges and connect with other people and not feel alone. Um, and so that's beautiful. No, that's that's really nice. Um, you've, you're you also a pescatarian, uh, it seems to say here. Pescatarian, I which means, I, I believe, uh, for those who don't follow uh, food terminology, I believe that means you think you're better than everybody else. Is that <laughs> Absolutely. No, that would be vegan. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so what, what's the joke? Um, a, a vegan and atheist and a CrossFitter walk into a bar and everyone knows <laughs> because they won't shut up about it. Right. Um, so I, I, I am a vegetarian. Um, I'm not an atheist. I am a CrossFitter. Uh, but I, I'm a pescatarian for, for ethical reasons. Um, I was a vegetarian for a long time. My health was suffering. And I'm one of those rare people that recognize, you know, I'm not going to lie. The body is, des- my body is designed to eat meat, to eat red meat, to eat chicken, to eat pork, whatever. But I've made a choice. And for me, eating fish is kind of the balance. My health came right back once I brought fish back in. Mm-hmm. But when I, when I go out to eat, you know, people say, well, what, what, you know, what don't you eat? It's like, I don't eat fur and feathers. You know, that's the easiest way to say it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're an interesting conflict here because on the one hand, you're pescatarian, you're crossfitting, you have this very uh, self-improvement mind, uh, self, uh, lifestyle. On the other hand, you ride a motorcycle. So which is it, Jeremy Lesniak? Uh, do you want to live forever or do you have a death wish? What's going on here? I want to live fully for as long as I'm here. Okay, boy, that was good. <laughs> I I love, you know, I love being on the motorcycle. I love, you know, my, my summer car is a, a Scion FRS. It's basically a, a street legal go-kart. Tons of fun. And I may or may not obey all street laws. Wow. While driving that car. Uh, I I do what works for me so long as it doesn't harm anybody else. My motorcycle I love riding that thing. It's it's a place where I feel free. Uh, if anyone hasn't ridden a motorcycle, the greatest way I can express it is imagine you're driving around, but you also get all of the smells. Hmm. And to be in your car and to then smell everything, you know, someone who just cut their grass or, you know, I live in Vermont, you know, driving by someone that's sawing lumber and you get that cut wood smell. There's nothing like it. You are so connected to the world. It's almost meditative. Let's go all the way. It is meditative. Good. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to ride one, but okay. I I like your passion for that. Um, Let's go dark here, sir. Um, You mentioned a little bit. We don't have to go into detail about uh, the struggles of uh, your youth, um, going through maybe some dark times back then. Um, It's really clear that, again, you're into self-improvement. You're into being very independent Um, And I find, at least for myself, maybe I'm projecting, people of your ilk are also usually pretty self-critical. Sometimes it can even just turn into like self-bullying. So how how do you feel about that? Do you feel that you are self-critical maybe too much? Are you a bully to yourself? I don't know that I'd say I'm a bully, but I set incredibly high standards for myself. Um, It is rare that I accomplish my goals because that's how high I set the bar. And that comes from the way I was raised to always do my best. And if you are not failing, you aren't reaching your potential. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a strong psychological component to that because if you set yourself up to accomplish a goal and you believe you're going to accomplish that goal and then you don't, that hurts. And if it continually hurts, I mean, you're, you're setting yourself up for some pretty challenging psychological stuff. And I went through a lot of that in my 20s. 
Hmm. You know, I, I looked up one day and just my, my life was not what I wanted it to be. And I, I won't go more into it than that. But as I've aged, I've learned to be a little bit better, a little softer with myself, realizing that, hey, sometimes it's okay to do what's adequate so you can invest the time and energy into something else that matters more. One of my favorite sayings lately is, if it's not a uh, heck yeah, it's a no. Cool. If it's not so compelling that it's a no-brainer, it's a no. Make time, make space for those no-brainers because you only have so much time, energy, money, you know, whatever. I'd say you're um, old wisdom in that. Um, the older I get, the more I believe that is absolutely right, yeah. In fact, that's going to be a great quote here. That's a good bumper sticker. If you're not failing, you're not going to reach your potential. You're not reaching your potential. I love that. Um, I'm curious about, since you've been start, you started martial arts back at the age of four, Usually I would ask people about how martial arts has changed your life, but I'm not even sure you can remember life without martial arts in it. Is that true? I, I can't. Yeah. M martial arts did not change my life. It, it guided my life. Mm -hmm. So, it, and it's, I, yeah. And how, what was the first influence that martial arts had on you that you thought that's a good influence and I'm going to keep this going. I like this. One of the difficulties in having always been a martial artist is it's really hard to have context to answer that question, <laughs> right? It wasn't until I was probably adolescent age that I even had a sense of what life could be without martial arts. Hmm. So to say, you know, what were you getting that you, that you needed? I don't know. If you've never been deprived of water, if no one's ever told you going without water is possible, would you even consider, I need water? Good and point. I think that's kind of where martial arts is for me. Now that I, I'm older and I can reflect back, I've got some semblance of where martial arts has changed for me. It's always been a place where I feel confident. I am most confident in wearing a gi. And even though Taekwondo is my primary art now, I still refer to it as a gi because that's what I was raised in. Sure. And I don't wear pullovers. I wear generally I wear wraparounds. I can have the worst day. I can feel small. I'm 5'7". I can feel unattractive. I can feel unloved. And the moment that I put on that gi and then my belt, my world changes because it's the place where I belong. And whether that's training in my living room or going out to a school to teach or going to a seminar to present or just going to one of the schools that I train at, that's my home. That's the place where I belong. And nothing else really matters when I'm on the floor. I might have some challenges of the day. And yeah, you know, I try to leave it all at the door. And sometimes it comes through. I'm not going to lie. But when you've been doing something for 30, coming on 34 years next month, you have some confidence in what you're doing. And you know that you can lean on that to remind yourself of, of who you are and, and what you're capable of. I think that's going to resonate with a lot of people listening, right? It's uh, your temple. I mean, not religious necessarily, but it's your happy place. It's your secure place. It's the place where you find structure in a often crazy world. So uh, I, I totally understand that feeling of tying on the belt or tying on the uniform and kind of saying, okay, I'm back to me now. Let's, <laughs> Let's get to work on making me even better and uh, kind of blocking things out. So I think that's yeah. going to resonate with people. I like that. And and I know that you just tested for your second degree in uh, Bill Wallace's Superfoot system. Um, yeah. yeah. After in all early these, June. It, uh -huh, uh, after all of these years, um, what other goals do you have? I mean, you're still earning rank. You're still out there uh, doing katas and tournaments. And um, what are you hoping to get out of your training now at this point? I just want to keep putting one foot in front of the other. You know, I'm, I'm at a point where fortunately and, and because of CrossFit, this is why CrossFit is important to me. I'm st I can still say at 38, I'm in the best shape of my life. And I've got a few more years of being able to say that. Mm. And that's really cool because I get to bring that into martial arts. You know, whereas in in June at the Superfoot testing and, you know, if anybody out there has ever even taken a, taken a seminar with Bill Wallace, you know how difficult that can be cardiovascularly. 
I was fortunate. I am fortunate because I don't have to spend the time working on my endurance to go into those tests. I can spend that same time training on skill because I'm, I'm, I'm handling the, the cardio stuff elsewhere. Um, I just want to keep learning. I want to, I believe that the best martial artist is a well-rounded martial artist. Mm -hmm. If, if you consider all of the things the world can throw at you, whether those are, are physical altercations or emotional challenges or whatever it is, the more experience you have and the more different ways, the better able you'll be able to handle and adapt to that situation. So that's part of what I'm doing now is where are the holes in my quote unquote game? You know, I'm never going into the UFC, but if we think of it in that way, in some kind of full contact, no holds barred kind of sense, where would I stink? And right now it's uh, my hands need some work. My jujitsu is kind of poor and I'm decent with weapons, but the Filipino stuff intrigues me. Well, there's a school near my house that is Kempo Jiu Jitsu Escrima. Perfect. So I'm training there because I'm plugging in holes. It's not that I care so much about rank. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing an orange belt in that school and that's so fun. Like I, I <laughs> haven't worn an orange belt since uh, my, my freshman year of college at, at this one school I was training at. I just love to train and I love to learn. I'm a perpetual student. So I think where am I heading? I'm just trying to put as much stuff in my head as possible. I love that perpetual student. I, I, I would, I would say that's one of the secrets to a happy life, right? Cause there's always the excitement of the unknown. There's always a sense of discovery when you wake up in the morning, like who knows what someone's going to say to change your perspective on things. And who knows what new information you find out about yourself or there's just so much to explore. And, uh, even with the age of YouTube and being able to look out on the internet and see so much information so rapidly, but it's still endless. Even as fast as all this information is coming in, it's still endless. It, you never get to the point where you're just saying like, I've seen it all. I know it all. I've done it all. I'm bored. I want to die. It's yeah. constantly invigorating. And I've learned more. I keep telling people I've learned more about martial arts and, and myself in the last five years, let's say, then every you know, the decades that preceded that, it's just it's it's the momentum just keeps going and going. It's it's quite the opposite of thinking like, well, the older you get and the higher in rank you get, the more you do it, it just gets less and less interesting or boring or less fulfilling. It's totally the opposite to me. It's like there's something about that just depth of experience that just is incredibly rewarding. And even on my worst day, wow, you can still look at something that you thought you knew and then find a new angle on it. And now the whole day is beautiful because like, wow, I never kicked quite like that before. That's a new little thought. Um, I just find it endlessly inspiring. So clearly you're on the same path. <laughs> Perpetual I student. I, I vowed, I mean, we, we all know people whose best days are behind them. And sometimes those best days happen way too early in life. You know, I, I'm getting ready for my 20 year high school reunion. And there are some folks that may or may not be there, but graduated with me and their best days were in high school. I vowed that that would never be me. My best days are always in front of me because I'm going to make sure that's the case. There's so much, as you said, there's so much more to learn. The more I learn, the more I realize I will never learn all of it because there's so much more. I have these epiphanies and this is one of the fun things about training in different styles with different instructors that one of them will teach me something that completely blows up other stuff that I thought I knew. And then it allows me to go back and look at all the other stuff I've done and say, okay, how does this fit in now with what I understand? And that's fun. I, I like that. Your, your best days are ahead of you. And now your job is just to make sure that that's what happens. Um, yeah. I, I think that is a challenge to anyone who's listening to this podcast. Um, make that happen for you too. Make sure that your glory days are ahead of you, or at least that's what you're working towards. Um, as opposed to just looking at old photos or thinking back to when you were happier with your life. Um, every day is brand new. You have a chance to start something new and to engage uh, with the world from a different angle. Um, so make that vow to yourself, to anyone who's listening, that your best day, if not today, is going to be tomorrow. And now just set up that plan and make that happen. I think that is a really powerful message right there from the Kata Meister. He knows what he's doing. The life meister. <laughs> no, no, that one I'm not taking. I'm not taking. That, that implies I haven't figured out. I do not. 
I'm, uh, I'm still trying to figure me out. Right on. Um, I noticed on uh, your um, website, you had an article uh, on your blog, um, advice that you would give yourself as a white belt. And it wasn't actually your advice. It was a guest post from someone else. So um, I'm wondering if you actually have your own answer to that question of the advice that you would give yourself or to any of our listeners who are still newer into martial arts um, or are looking for a new approach to martial arts. Um, what advice do you give to people commonly or would you give to yourself um, as a younger martial artist? Yeah, and this actually is something I've thought about a lot. It's crept into a number of the episodes that we've done on our show and it's about comparing yourself to others. You know, one of the things that I love about martial arts that so many people love is that it's a very individualized thing. In most martial arts schools that I'm familiar with, the standards for progressing in rank are not exactly the same across the board. Mm -hmm. It's showing a level of competency and demonstrating knowledge, but especially as you get better, different people are going to find things that resonate more with them. Some people are better fighters than others. Some people are better at forms. Some people have better endurance. That doesn't mean that when someone puts in their time, they haven't gotten better. And to sit there and to compare this person after this amount of time to this person after this amount of time and say that one is a better martial artist than another. I mean, roll back. We talked about all of the, the mental, the psychological aspects that, excuse me, anybody that's been around martial arts for more than a few minutes knows are so critical. It's that personal development, that journey that I think means so much. And it's easy to not realize that as a beginner. When you're in a beginner, you're generally standing in the back of the room and you're watching everyone else do all these things better than you and you don't know what's going on and maybe you don't even have a belt yet and when you get a belt, you don't know how to tie it and you're just you're floundering. You're feeling like everything you do is wrong because you see all these people doing so many things right. And it's easy to forget that those people have put in hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of hours to get to where they are and the greatest progress comes when you stop looking at what everyone else is doing and you look at you as a martial artist, your own martial arts brand, flavor, and focus on making that the best for you. I'm 5'7". I'm on a heavy day 160 pounds. The way I approach martial arts in training, in competition, the way I would use it in a, heaven forbid, a real life situation is very different than someone who's 6'3 and 220. So to say that we're the same and we should be expected to do things the same at the same level is silly. Amen. Yeah, it's it's an art after all. That's the part people often yes. forget, right? It's martial arts. So we wouldn't paint the same. We wouldn't cook the same. We don't sing the same. So why anyone be would be expected to be like a robot or a duplicate of your teacher makes no sense. <laughs> Um, it's interesting to me how you have a balance between, like we all do as a, as a young man, between looking up to certain people as mentors to kind of guide your way in life, whether it's through uh, Tupac's poetry or a way to stand up for yourself and to take control of things on your own, like through rap music, um, and or through me, like looking at Bruce Lee and his his control of his body. And we look to these things as young people, but then to be able to grow through that period and then start expressing your own life, finding that art in it. And now you're a guy with, you know, your own company, independent. You can make your own hours. You, you're doing your CrossFit. You're doing your thing. You're doing it all right. I mean, I, I just love having you in the community and knowing that you're out there. Um, so I really do hope that your story here that you've been sharing and your example will inspire others to be themselves and to uh, get out of the house. And if that can get them into a martial arts studio and you can find some other People just like you who are just looking to fight for a happy life and um, find their own way. I, I, I really think this has been valuable. So I, I appreciate all of your time here, sir. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been an honor, pleasure to talk to you, as always. You know, I ho hope it happens again soon. It doesn't have to be recorded, but 
Maybe I'll do that anyway and not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, I do have to uh, take your confession about um, running amok on our roadways. I do have to submit this podcast to the authorities in your local area to make sure they're on the watch out for you and your motorcycle and your sports car there. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. They won't catch me. <laughs> oh, wow. A challenge as well to the law enforcement community. You heard him, folks. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> if people would like to continue to follow your journey, please let us know where can we find you. Sure. The hub for everything we do is whistlekick.com. There's no punctuation in there. It's the word whistle and the word kick. Uh, anybody from the New England area or might be a fan of American whiskey, we are not Whistle Pig, which is also based in Vermont. Uh, I have a lot of friends trying to, to urge some, some co-marketing on that. And if I can find the hook, I will. Uh, and from whistlekick.com, you can get to the, our podcast, which is whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. All the social media, which is at Whistlekick everywhere. I'm not hard to find. There are only a few Jeremy Lesniaks in the world. Uh, we're all friends on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, if, if you see stuff related to goats, although there's a, a, a decent high school football player named Jeremy Lesniak right now. That's not me. Hmm. So, all right. yeah. Perfect. Start at Whistlekick.com and, and the rest is pretty easy. I love it. Well, I thank you again for being a great role model out there and for all the work you're doing. And uh, I hope your journey continues and you keep fighting for a happy life, sir. Thanks for having me. You too. I don't know about you, but I feel better every time I meet another person making the same journey as I am. A different path, maybe. I don't have earrings, but the same journey. Like I said, you'll find links to both Jeremy's company, Whistlekick, and his podcast, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, in the show notes for this episode over on FightForAHappyLife.com. Until next time, smiles up, my friend. Let that smile be your shield and your sword. Keep fighting for a happy life. For more podcasts, videos, and articles, visit SenseiAndo.com or FightForAHappyLife.com. As I listened back through to this interview, it reminded me how comfortable I was with Sensei Endo. He's a good guy. And the conversations that we've had, both within and outside of interviews, our emails, our social media commentary to each other, I just like him. He's a likable guy. And I don't get any sense that anything he's putting on is contrived. I hope that if you haven't, you will check out his show, Fight for a Happy Life. When I say I listen to it and I listen to every episode, I mean that. I do. I listen to every episode. I don't listen to every episode of every podcast I listen to, but his is one that I always make sure to check out because it is so well done and because I know a tremendous amount of thought and insight is going to be behind and inside every episode. So check that out. If you want to check out what we've got going on, it's whistlekick.com. It's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, maybe smile twice, <laughs> in honor of Sensei Endo, and have a great day. <laughs>